kidding me? Bruh. Okay, testing. Why is that so quiet? Is it just my audio? Why is this only in 480p? Oh well, I'm sticking with it. I don't want to redo it. I'll have to fix that later. Luckily, I don't really need more for this. Okay, I guess I'll just get started. I don't really have anything else to talk about. Um, I just recently streamed like three days ago. So, like I talked about all the study ideas I've had. Uh, what I've done in between then and now is basically I just finished this book. Probably should have done more, but uh, later tonight I want to go through Turchin and maybe collect some data. I also have an article I need to write. Um... So yeah, that's basically, I just wanted to increase my stream capacity because uh, I should be doing this full time for the next three months. And then hopefully after that, if I can turn it into uh, <laughs> a good source of income, like an acceptable source of income in the next three months, then I just don't have to um, go get, go to grad school or whatever. But if I do have to go to grad school, I'll be part time again after three months, but I should be able to do at least two like book streams or whatever else and a bunch of other stuff I've been trying to I basically just been on like a staycation for the last week and a half after my finals finished I haven't been doing much and so now I'm trying to really increase my output because like I said I'd like to build this into something I could maybe live off of in the next 
three months. So that's a quarter of a year. It's a pretty decent amount of time. Um, so yeah, it should be like two streams a week now for the next three months. So this is the second stream and should be able to put out at least one Substack article a week. My Substack has been sort of dormant. It's been, it's still been growing lately though, which is good. I should probably do like one YouTube video. I need to really get out some like good, interesting YouTube videos. My video output has been sort of ignored recently and I can see why it's because I'm just posting uninspired crap. I don't know what to, I don't know exactly what to do though. Cause it's like, I try to regurgitate HPD for views, but then the Rutherford thing is falling off. No one cares. Cause it's like part three of a book. No one read anyway. And then the exuciology stuff doesn't get any clicks usually. My most successful videos have been, let me, let me just pull up the video list. My most successful videos have been, um, talking about other YouTubers. So I guess I need to do that more. Maybe dunk, maybe I just need to copy some of these other people and dunk on leftists more. No one cared about Rod Dreer. Um, but my Leather Apron Club videos and my Keith Woods stuff. I guess I could start dunking on Academic Agent. Um, I don't know. That feels like low-hanging fruit, though. Yeah, I don't know. Post any ideas. Send a $3 super chat with any ideas if you have any. Okay, yeah, so I'll just get into it. So basically what this book is... Um, is there's a branch of study called public choice theory, which is applying the tools of microeconomics, mostly just rational utility theory, which you can find in my manuscript, which you should check out on my Substack, by the way. Um, just like you assume that people are maximizing their utility, and then you can sort of do logic on how people will behave with respect to money because they're going to maximize their income and that sort of thing. So public choice theory is just analyzing politics by assuming that people are going to act like rational utility maximizers. And it seems to work pretty well, actually. Like uh, people do really seem to be pretty selfish. I have a video on that if you look on my channel. And a lot of the predictions pan out, I think. Um, when I talked about the Bayesian rationalists last stream and we looked at a study and you know the predict it had like 91 percent accuracy which is pretty good people are not totally selfish so like a totally selfish utility maximizing model doesn't have total accuracy but it's pretty accurate it's like more accurate than nothing and so public choice theory is just trying to apply that to theories of politics and you could argue that this is what, like, Curtis Yarvin should have been doing. He wanted to be all deductive. I mean, it doesn't get better when it comes to trying to deduce a theory of politics than using the rational choice axiom. He could have been a public choice theorist, and instead he was just like, I don't even, I don't even know what he was doing. So this is the first, th this book came out in the 50s by a guy named Anthony Downs, and it's the first in a series of uh, public choice theory texts. And so I started it off with a summary because it's actually a pretty sim uh, simple book. It's like 250 pages long, but you don't really need to read all of it. It's, uh, it's really pretty simple. It's got like two main assumptions. So th the first is that parties are rational. Uh, with re specifically with respect to maximizing votes. So they always want to be elected. 
And so the votes come first and the policies come later. This is as opposed to thinking that the parties are true believers and thinking that they set off to accomplish specific policies and do what they do what they can to build votes for those policies. No, like pol politicians and parties are modeled in this as being rational vote maximizers. So they create their policies to Username 37 cent $40 you maybe could study the Spanish and Greek dictatorships, both of them basically fell when they let in American dollars just off Wikipedia. Looks like that might be why dictators are isolationist also have some free money king. Thanks, big shout out. I'll have to look into that. The Spanish and Greek dictatorships like uh, Franco, they fell when American dollars came in. That's probably... I mean, if they're using American dollars, then the U.S. can tax them because the U.S. creates American dollars. Let's see, some guy's saying the sound is very low. Let me test that. Oh, yeah, that's kind of true, actually. Let me, let me see if I can... Apparently, I can only turn it down. This is the ghetto stream. It's the low sound uh, for 480p stream. So I'll have to fix this after after this stream. But I don't really want to restart. It's kind of low. You have to max your volume to hear it well. It's not that low if you just max your volume. You got to turn up your system volume all the way and then turn up the YouTube volume. Yeah, I don't think it's going to let me fix that So right now, so I have to fix it after the stream. But yeah, thanks for the super chat. I'll have to look into that, like under credit theory. But basically, um, like a specific a specific type of money, like what who, whoever's money you're using, uh, you pay taxes to them. Basically, that if you read David Graeber on this, uh, his debt book, he talks about this, and I mean that's frankly that's simply what's happening. If you're using USD, then the Federal Reserve in America prints your currency, and when they print currency, it's a tax, right? Like printing printing the dollar is just a hidden tax, so even if they can't physically extract from you, when they print USD and then there's inflation globally, you suffer from inflation. Like all the, all the credit you have in USD is basically taxed, whereas if you had it in gold or some other currency that was accepted, it would stay the same while the dollar inflated. So if they can tax you, yeah, they have some power over you. So, and there's there's the other way where it's like, well, why would they open up to the dollar? If you open up to the dollar, you're probably more friendly with America. Um, and so then the dictatorship is softening. But yeah, anyway, back to this first book in public choice theory. He assumes that part or parties make their policies in order to maximize their votes, and then voters are voting to maximize their utility with respect to government action. And so specifically, that means they're voting based on the expected utility they're going to get from the policies that they're voting for, uh, not necessarily on stuff like personality or just random votes. And so he draws... so. I'm a little bit underwhelmed with this book. It's interesting, but a lot of it's just verbal. Like, there's not much math in it. He just, it's like, oh, we're going to assume rational utility. And then it's just all words. So it's its pretty decent, but it's like not real logic. It's pseudo logic. So it's not even given that any of this necessarily follows from these assumptions. Like, you're just supposed to vibe that. It's just rhetoric. 
right? He doesn't actually like bust out a utility maxing equation like I do in my manuscript and then like very clearly lay out his assumptions and then say like algebraically all this this follows. He's just like, oh, if voters are like rational, then um, they'll choose ignorance sometimes when like being informed is costly, and the and it's like at no, it, he's not not even writing math. He's just importing new new ideas like ignorance and stuff like that. But it sounds it sounds legit. It's a lot better than just like random navel gazing, like whatever Yarvin was doing, like just babbling about the cathedral. See, I think, like, and Yarvin's big thing was, like, a critique of democracy, and this book basically contains every critique of democracy he ever did, and it's it's better and more, it's ten times more concise. So I've been posting about that on my Twitter. Um, there's this thing called the Arrow Theorem, which shows that a democracy with sufficient variation um, and, like, sufficiently, like, widespread, like, different minority views will have the minority dominate on a bunch of different policies. Or no, I don't know if that was the arrow problem. You'll also always have um, the opposition win, so the government will just switch every single election cycle. If there's like at least one uh, minority issue that follows, we're going to look at this. <laughs> if there's at least one minority issue, so because th that's like the most math that's in, in this book, and it's just like this scathing critique of democracy. So one of the key one of the key takeaways from this book that this guy argues is that democracy relies on pretty vast consensus and it goes crazy. It's it should go crazy insofar as it's really a democracy. Uh, to whatever degree there's actually like preference variance in the population. Like it works best when everyone agrees and is this rational median voter and the more that people are spread out and have like fundamentally different needs and desires. Uh, the more that it just doesn't work and you get weird stuff like the government switches every four years and um, no one's rational and uh, information doesn't matter at all and the government can't get anything done because the policies all negate each other. Sounds about right, honestly. That's kind of what's happening in the U.S. Uh, insofar as the U.S. is actually a democracy, the U.S. only has any stability whatsoever. Insofar as it's not a democracy at this point, so he also talks about uh, weak, what I call weak political agency theory. So he doesn't talk about power, which is probably the biggest issue with this book. He just doesn't mention power whatsoever, where power is defined as something like wealth creation violence capacity etc like a like superior alpha like a superior ability to impact other people's utility function he just totally leaves that out there's no concept of of that whatsoever in this book so he just assumes everyone is fundamentally equal more or less uh the only things that he like briefly mentions variation in is um he says some people he like you know, kind of mentions IQ, saying that some people will have an easier time processing information, but he doesn't think that that matters that much. And then he admits um, political agency advocation. He coins, he, he says that some people are agitators and like to agitate and sort of leaves it at that. So there's like weak political agency. It's not... Um, very strong and so i think it skews it skews the analysis a little bit that he leaves power out but it is interesting that he's noticing the same things as me in the 50s oh and then uh the other thing is the median voter theorem which this guy didn't make up it was in some other journal article, but this, it figures heavily in this book, and I think it popularized it a lot. And it just says in a two-party system, it's rational for the parties to basically have the same set of policies, uh, especially when the electorate or the or the pool of voters is not like incredibly bipolar, like incredibly split. 
And this causes what he calls, he just says it's irrationality when the parties basically have the same policies, meaning the choice hardly matters, and then people just vote by like uh, politician personality. That's kind of how it seemed to be for the most part um, with respect to a lot of issues, a lot of important issues, particularly before 2016. It's like uh, McCain versus Obama. Wow, that's a compelling choice. I mean, literally, it's like just choose skin tone and then it's the same government, basically. Um, like with re with respect to a lot of actually important issues like immigration and civil rights and that sort of thing. And insofar as that isn't true, it would probably be because of stuff that this book misses, like uh, power existing. And so insofar as the policies of those two men were different, it was because, you know, they were backed by different people, not because of their voter appeal. Um, so it's literally just like fiscal pot, like what they're going to do to taxes. Are they going to slightly lower taxes on some people? Or are they going to lower corporate taxes slightly or raise, maybe slightly raise them and raise upper middle class income tax? I don't know. So. But yeah, that's the summary. So now we can go through this. So. He starts by he starts in the introduction chapter one by assuming that people are rational and then discover their goals, like what satisfies their utility functions and what the optimal way to achieve that goal is. So he says firms maximize profits, consumers utility, and asks what do the parties maximize. He says every government maximizes political support. And Inherent in the model is what I call the magical sovereign democracy. So he just takes like what you could call the constitution as given. And so he says that the governing party has total power, including over the economy, and can do literally anything except violate the constitutional human and electoral rights. So they can basically do anything except abolish democracy and like maybe freedom of speech. Like they could implement total like economic communism for four years. Um, and he doesn't really say why that would be. He's just very, he just he just treats like the structure of the government is given. He just lets the government be like a magical sovereign and democracy be this magical thing that exists. And then he's, uh, he doesn't, he doesn't say where democracy comes from. The whole point is like, given that you have this magical sovereign democracy, like what happens under rationality? That's the point of the book. Whereas I'm more interested in the, the other question is to like, why would you have this thing called a democracy at all? Is it really sovereign? Can the government do anything to the economy or is it not powerful enough? You know, I think that these are very important questions worth asking. So it's like, I, I, I called it the political scientist fallacy to basically assume that. That's kind of what all the political sci so-called scientists do. So is they're not curious about that at all. They assume the magical sovereign democracy, like the government is all powerful. We just need to scrutinize how people vote. Is we don't need to ask like what even is a vote? Like how did people even get to vote? Why would you let people vote? Why is only the government a democracy? Why does it not seem like a democracy? Why is everything else a dictatorship? Every literally every other institution in society is a dictatorship or an oligarchy. Why is only the government a democracy? Why is every other government in history a dictatorship? Where, like, where did that come from? Should we take it seriously? Uh, no, they don't care. Like, what sort of you know what sort of economic and genetic circumstances would lead to? Let's let people vote. Um, they're not interested in that. They don't answer any of that. They just they're just like we have a magical sovereign democracy. Um, People just vote and that's that. So we need to analyze uh, why congressmen act how they do in the magical sovereign democracy and why voters vote how they do. And then that's political science.
Seb says, hello, Mr. Brodsky. Welcome to the super secret HBD club. So anyway, they have th really three assumptions. So I talked about it in the summary. They think that they have two main assumptions, rational or no. Well, they think that they only have like one assumption here, which is rational voters, but they have another one. So varying uncertainty, like in the beginning of this model, they just leave the uncertainty out and then they introduce uncertainty. But then the other thing is, is the magic democratic structure. So the chapter one introduction in, uh, talks about the rational voter. And so chapter two talks about the rational party. So again, the government has magical sovereignty. Um, a party is, is a team, which is not a bad assumption. They don't really scrutinize individuals. They just assume that a party is totally coordinated with perfect goal alignment among members. Um, and that they're pretty much just selfish and want to get elected. They don't care about like the common good or any abstractions like that. And so he says the fundamental hypothesis of his model, or one of the two, is that parties formulate policies in order to win elections rather than win elections in order to formulate policies. And this is reminiscent of the fourth tenet of the Iron Law of Oligarchy, which is talking about how the leaders are Machiavellians, essentially. And this is basically the same thing. So Michels wrote that in political parties. He said based on his study, they act like Machiavellians, which supports, remember, his. it was a proto-scientific empirical study. It was his experience, um, particularly dealing with socialists. And so he said that the leaders tend to be motivated by the desire for power, prestige, and income, the love of conflict, and not really by, like, grand ideas or whatever, by, like, actually implementing socialism. They just act like vote maximizers. That's what Michelle, Michelle's noticed among socialist party leaders. And so that's the same thing here as the fundamental hypothesis. So the fundamental hypothesis of the parties is essentially the fourth tenet of the iron law of oligarchy from political parties. So if you accept that book is legitimate and the sort of anecdata evidence in it, that's some evidence um, verifying that hypothesis of the model. So he talks about the basic logic of voting and essentially they're just comparing the expectation of the utilities for the two different parties Um, and so he's, assume, he's also assuming basically like this just magic two party system, which that's another question. Why does America only have two parties? Where does that come from? Why is that logical? He doesn't really ask. He's just like, oh, it just has two parties. So people will compare the utility on how they vote. It's pretty simple. He says in order to find his current party differential, a voter in a two party system must do the following one. Examine all phases of government action to find out where the two parties would behave differently. Two, discover how each difference would affect his utility income. And three, aggregate the differences in utility and arrive at a net figure which shows how much one party would be better than the other. This is how a rational voter would behave in a world of complete and costless information. And he also assumes that that information is correct, which is similar to what I, what I found with the Bayesian deception thing. So he's, he's already there. He's, he's saying there's basically no lies. No one's deceived. There's just sometimes a lack of information. So proprietary information can give you an edge, but there's basically no uh, long-lived. There's no lies over the long run, essentially. Those should get filtered out, which is Bayesian uh 
like Bayesian persuasion. Bayesian persuasion is basically like ordering incomplete information in a certain way and not deception. And of course the voters in this model just have these fixed tastes, like it's just a result of their genetics or whatever, they're not changed, like parties can't change their tastes. The government can't change the tastes of the voters. So chapter four is the, the basic logic of government decision-making. So parties want to spend such that they maximize their votes over the next cycle. And he just assumes total information, which is basically like they know how every single voter will react to any given bill that they pass, which is kind of ridiculous. That's more ridiculous than maybe assuming an informed voter. But, okay, here's this interesting theorem, so how minority views win. So you have the set of issues P, and you have the incumbent government, and you have the opposition party that's out of the government that wants to win. And so S is the subset of P where the opposition takes a minority stand on those issues. Now, the opposition wins with those minority stands when more than 50% of people prefer a position in S, right? So there are multiple minority positions. So more than 50% of people can prefer at least one position in S, the subset of P, where the opposition takes a minority stand, and those preferences give more utility than is lost on the majority positions. So it's a, uh, it's, it's, uh, I think, cardinality, right? So it's the magnitude. It's magnitude versus direction. So it's not just direction, it's magnitude. So the magnitude of those minority positions gives more utility than is lost on the majority position. Positions they hold that the opposition rejects. Thus, more than 50% of people get more net utility by voting for the opposition with their minority positions. So that's how, that's how minority views win in a rational democracy. But then, the, but then the arrow problem follows. So he says, let there be positions A, B, and C. So say you have three people, and these are their preference orders. So like person A prefers A over, or person one prefers A over B and B, B over C. Okay, so if the incumbent government picks position A, then the opposition wins with position C. So for any position that the government picks when there's three different policies, and there's this variation in, in which policies are preferred over another, the opposition can always win. So if the government picks A, then C is preferred by person two and three, so the, the opposition wins with a two-thirds majority. But if the government picks C, then the opposition wins with B, because persons one and two prefer B over C. But if the, if the government picks B, then the opposition wins on A, because uh, person one and person three prefer A over B. So if the government has to pick a position to run on, to implement, um, when, you, when you have this sufficient diversity of views and policy preferences and this diversity of policy choice, the opposition always wins. But then if you have that in the policy pool and the gene pool, then like if that's not taken care of, if that doesn't for some reason disappear, the opposition will win. Like the government that gets voted out on the first cycle will come back in because it'll just change its position. Or the, the other position will have a super, the same, it's same position or no. 
but if the government can change its position, then or if there if another opposition can form, then the opposition will always win in every election. So there's no permanent government ever. And he says, perhaps we can conclude from this that democracy cannot function in a certain world unless consensus among voters is almost complete on all issues. And that's a common theme throughout this book. He says uncertainty ma masks that in the real world. But a common theme throughout this book is that if there's not, even under uncertainty, if, there's, if, the, if the views are very split apart, um, democracy is not stable. That reminds me of that Pew poll. Let me see, Pew, increasing polarization. So you can see how there's this huge overlap, you know, more back when this book was written, there's still huge overlap in 2014 I mean, look how close uh, the medians of both parties are, right? And so that's that's sort of what this guy is saying you need for a stable system. Is they separate, you get government shutdowns and total war and all these things. Killer Pascal says, you didn't read my coffee chats yet from weeks ago. Okay, I'll read them. I'll read them when I'm done with the slides. Oh, and he says that the, okay, so all these variables in his model are interdependent. So government actions are a function of expected votes and opposition act actions, but opposition actions are a function of voter utility and government action. So you need game theory for that, but he doesn't get into that. He doesn't really go past this. So this is the first part of his book. It's really basic utility stuff applied to the magical sovereign democracy with the interesting arrow problem. So on, on, then he gets into uncertainty. So he assumes everyone can reason, which is a big assumption that I don't necessarily share, but descriptive knowledge varies. And he gives the different types of uncertainty. Basically, they can be uncertainty, uh, uncertain about everything. So their utility could go down, but they don't know why. They can't predict how a policy will change their utility. Uh, they don't know what the government's doing. They can't predict how their vote will impact policy, and they don't know how others will vote. And then parties don't necessarily know what will actually happen to the economy if they introduce a policy. They don't know, even if they did know what would happen to the economy, they don't know what happens to utility functions. 
Um, talks about relative influence of voters, which is interesting. They don't know how much the voters are paying attention, and they don't know what their opposition will do so that they can counter it. And so he says for government decision making, oh, he gives an interesting formulation for agitators. So these are basically, I coin, I, I call them advo advocates, and this is a thing in, in political agency. And so he says that uh, certain voters will agitate, and, and I had an idea for like a law of mass riots or mass protests and it's like uh, the number of people that show up should be proportional to like the advocation constant so the number of high, po high political agency people or the distribution of high political agency people or high advocation people at least and um, the cost and so he's basically saying the same thing he's saying agitation is related to party differential which basically just means cost from the wrong party winning. So when your party differential is high, you really hate the opposition. And then there's a threshold. So your agency is how low your threshold is. So some people have lower thresholds than others for agitation. So he says persuasion and influence will emerge from uncertainty. So he talks about leadership and doesn't mention power at all. And he defines leadership as the ability to influence voters to adopt certain views as expressing their own will. So that's basically just like uh, giving people true information that they maybe didn't have before. So it's like an information leader. And so that has to emerge from uncertainty. So he only has persuasion. He doesn't have power, which would basically be violence and like wealth deprivation. So he only he only has persuasion, and persuasion is going to be uh, leadership. And he does talk about interest groups and favor buyers briefly. So he says interest groups want specific policies and pro will propagandize voters for them. And they will claim to represent the people. Favor buyers just drop the pretense and try to just buy policies. And most citizens are not very informed whatsoever. Really, if it's stuff that doesn't really affect them, they don't have any opinions about it, which is pretty trivial. But if it's stuff that hardly affects them, they still won't have opinions about it. And he, he recommends influence coefficients for favor seekers. So he's sort of he's sort of getting into the power stuff, but he, he forgets this later on in the book and doesn't talk about it anymore. So I have some I have some notes here and I'm like so if you do if you do have power and like you have people who are in hierarchies then voting wouldn't really be like voting would sort of be weighted by how much money each person is spending on the vote because when power exists the powerful just change how people they have power over will vote. So think about if someone's like even just like an employee of Amazon or something. Uh, for one, they need to vote in a way that benefits their company or else their employment could be threatened. So they vote for Amazon economically. So Amazon has that power over them and then culturally. Certainly if their vote's not really anonymous, if they have to reveal their vote to others, it can become a signal to power. They can't be caught voting for Donald Trump or else they could be fired. So that can manufacture um, 
certain votes. Stuff like that. So he talks about ideology, like Mosca political formula briefly. And it's basically just like Walter Lippmann stereotype stuff. So it's like an advertisement um, for proles to get informed at low cost. So it's this sort of easy way to, because think about if you don't have an ideology, you just have to talk about specific policies and very low IQ and political agency people won't even know what you're talking about. If you're like, um, I want to, uh, you know, do this, this, and this. You know, I want to cut funding for education this much. I want to implement this infrastructure bill. Um, I want to cut down maybe immigration by like 90% or something. Even that's like more numerical and cognitive stress, uh, cognitively stressing than just being like blood and iron uh, or blood and soil or whatever, you know. Um, So ideologies are sort of this very easy way to communicate what you're about. And they emerge because of information costs, essentially. No one wants to go through your whole, I mean, just read like a party, like parties put out platforms that are like pages and pages long talking about specific esoteric policies. Just think about like, okay, I think the labor party did this recently. Like, so think about this big, long, boring platform. Yeah, 107 pages. Yeah, who wants, who has time to read this? Well, uh, a lot of the stuff about information and uncertainty just talks about how it's irrational to bother reading this and how nobody has time for this and who even cares so it's like you got to have ideology to try to communicate this more efficiently like oh yeah we're about equality and giving more gibbs to uh like government workers and school teachers because nobody's reading No one, no one's reading all this, and even this isn't that complicated. I mean, this, this, this in and of itself is loaded with ideology. I'm not seeing enough numbers on here. You really just want like a policy platform, and you know you're gonna get like a 400-page book about economic policy. It's like, uh, just give me like a soundbite about how you're about equality and stuff like that. But the ideology needs to be consistent with past behavior or else people can't predict how you'll act. So they can't, they can't predict like a high utility from how you act if you don't have some sort of consistency. Um, at least with like what you say matching what you do to some degree. Because if what you say doesn't mean anything, then people will not know what you're going to do at all. So either your actions need to be consistent over time or what you say needs to predict your actions consistently. And so he calls he calls the latter being reliable and the former being responsible. And he calls integrity just um, it being straightforward, so no weird function because that's sort of a technical redundancy. But in theory, it could be like reverse psychology, like you do the opposite of what you say. So technically, you can predict what you're going to do from what you say, but it goes through a weird function. It's not straightforward, so you don't have integrity. But you do act reliably as opposed to randomly. Okay. Um,
So then he starts talking about the median, the median voter theorem. And he talks about how in two parties, if extremists don't protest, abstain, then convergence will happen on the center, on the median. And you can, and you can think about this, it's because... Um, Latinx right-wing death squad sent $2 lift or die. Yo, big shout out, I feel you. I be lifting out here. I just got a new gym because my old gym has too low square footage and very it's got a very trashy clientele with lots of tattoos and lots of uh, very garbage garbage people and you have people like lifting uh you have people trying to like troll you at this gym so i found a different i found a different gym with uh more square footage so it's less packed together and um it's less annoying at this old gym i went to it's like very it's like very packed let me okay people are saying raise the volume of your voice let me try. Okay, let me listen to the video. Okay. Okay, let me turn up the... I can't do it through software, but I can try to turn up the volume button on my microphone. But that lets in background noise. Okay, yeah, but anyway, so back to, I think this is as loud as it's going to get for this stream. I really need to fix the 480p, and the this should be streaming in 1440p. I, I need to fix the audio in the 480p after the stream. But anyway, with the gym, I was... 22-year-old Latinx liftocratic frog sent $2. This is my last day being 22. Fuck the gay Philo right and take their women. Yeah, fuck the Philo Sophistry right. Take their they don't have any women. What women are you gonna take? They don't have any women. They're all they're all gay. <laughs> I was gonna say they're all pederasts, but uh that's only one section. There's the there's the there's the lack section, I guess. But yeah. They're still pretty gay though. There's the section of the philosophist right that likes the likes the teen males, and then there's there's the ones that like the like the gay bears, the lack <laughs> the lack side, the lack side likes the likes the fat thirty year old hairy dudes. But uh, yeah, so they don't they don't have any women. You'd see the women if they had the women. I'm thinking H the HBD side. They got at least one girl. There's like two girls, maybe. There's like HBD chick. Is there an, is there another girl? I think the HBD side has one female, and the Philo Sophistry side has no bitches whatsoever. I can't think of a single Philo Sophist girl. Yeah, Ju I guess my stream's delayed, but Julius Caesar says HBD chick. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. H HBD. I thought there was another. I thought there was another girl on the HBD side. Kind of. Uh, what's her name? Uh, Simone Collins, maybe Simone Collins, wife of Malcolm Collins. They're kind of HBD, I think. They're like crypto HBD. She's a woman. She's more. They they seem to be more HBD than. So we got like uh. We got like definitely one woman, and then like maybe another woman like half in, like half into it. And the Philosoph has got no females whatsoever. So I think that the.
Yeah, the breeder couple? Yeah, it's Chad. It's applied HPD. She applies it to her own. She applies it to her she applies embryo selection to her own life. Isn't that based? What are and Philosophus can't even do that. HBD is real. So you get people, you get like a breeder couple. You get like a eugenics embryo selection couple. The what are the philosophists gonna do? Read books. They can't they can't make super babies. HBD people can make super babies. You get one woman into HBD and they're super babies. And they take over the world. What are the philosophists going to do? Read Hegel? That's why they're cringe. They don't get this. But HBD, HBD people are going to have super babies and take over the world. So, That distracted me. I was talking about the gym. I guess I'll just go back to the slides. I'm trying to think. I feel like we got at least one more. One more woman on the HBD side. I'm really just thinking of people I follow on Twitter. I've seen, I don't think I follow. I follow Simone and Malcolm Collins. They have that joint account. I don't follow HBD chick, but I see her retweeted sometimes. I don't know if she's inactive right now. Aiden Paladin? Yeah, see, we got three. Yeah, I did an alt hype stream with her. See, we got three. We got three whole women and the Philo, like, literally name one girl on the Philo Sophistry side. Has Bronski ever talked about J Man and HBD's chicks theory of Western Europeans, like Hajna line? And being less tribalistic and more universalistic than other people, white leftists especially. Yeah, that sounds about right. I, would, I read part of Kevin McDonald's individualism in the Western liberal tradition, which is basically that. Okay. Um, they talk about how parties need to weigh coherence versus integration. So that's weighing broad ideological appeal and deep cardinality. So voters want a good expectation for their utility returns, but low variance. So... This means like parties will have a spread of policies, obviously, because there's like multiple policies. And they'll tend to be in different zones ideologically, and you can typically only tell parties apart by their few extremist positions. But a voter wants the least policies that they disagree with, so they prefer low variance. And as, as the party platforms converge, he talks about how voters become irrational and just make decisions on some basis other than the issues. It's pretty simple if you think about median voter theorem.
So he says, like, party rationality contradicts voter rationality because parties will converge and will therefore try to create irrational voters. Okay, and then finally, he talks about information. So the interesting thing is he talks about something like a credibility function where people will learn to trust specific sources based on the information payoff from those sources. So I said you could model that as a boost over the default information environment. Like So like new information is a service worth paying for proportional to the boost to your utility. So if an info source doesn't give a payoff, a rational util maxer won't go back. And that's, again, another reason why deception isn't going to work, because, like, if that's what's happening, uh, no one's going to willfully consume deceptive garbage that then, by definition, harms their, like, lowers their utility function. And then that also applies to just straight up delegating all decision making to someone that you trust to return to you high utility, so you don't even... Uh, parse information you just like find someone who tells you what to do and then you trust them if it works out repeatedly and that makes sense for like low, lower IQ people who suck with info processing because it's way more costly for them to just pay for information and think for themselves And so that's maybe the stuff of leadership is uh, being a businessman that makes decisions for other people. Your business is making decisions for other people and giving them returns on it. And you do well if you give people back uh, good utility. And so that's not power over those people because power is making people do stuff that they don't want to do. It's leadership because you... Or like replacing their executive function politically, but you have to give them stuff that they want. Like that's the whole point or else they'll go somewhere else. So I'm kind of like that. I'm like, a, I'm like an info source and people. Oh, and he talks about how people will um, gravitate towards information sources that give them information that's relevant to them because different information will be relevant to different people who have different issues with the political state currently. And so, you know, it's like people watch me insofar as I give you information like this that, uh, you know, maybe improves your life, is at least entertaining, but maybe, you know, gives you utility, uh, informs you on things that you weren't that informed on and increases your utility from your decision making. So if you find that that happens from the info I talk about, then you'll come back. And so he talks about how there'll be like political inequalities anytime there's division of labor. So like weak political agency people or theory, like weak po the weak political agency theory, which is that like, if you have to work a 40 hour a week job, it doesn't really matter who you are, you don't have that much time for politics, stuff like that. So that's division of labor, presence of uncertainty, cost of information. So you don't even need like, oh, some people are just low IQ and can't even understand it and therefore have to delegate decision making. Oh, and he says because of this, like, um, ra a rational electorate will be unequally informed because it's more rational for some people to get more informed than others. And so any concept of democracy that assumes equally well-informed citizens assumes those citizens are irrational. Then he says the foundations of differential political power and democracy are rooted in the very nature of society. Pretty base take. 
You know, I say it's also rooted in genetics because I'm a proponent of the strong theory of political agency. And then he gives one final take on how, like, if your politics are more obvious, like you really just hate abortion more than anything else, you don't need more information because, you know, Democrats are for abortion and, you know, Republicans are against it. And so, like, the esoteric, like, infrastructure funding doesn't even compare to the utility from being against abortion. So you always vote Republican and so you don't really need any information. Whereas... If you're like very moderate on abortion and stuff like that, and you're like in between, you're like the median, you're very in between the two parties, you need to have more information. You need to get down into the weeds on tax policy and, you know, the capital gains tax and uh, tariff policy and, you know, foreign aid and crap like that and try to make your decision based on. Like, like the smaller your party differential, the more information you need because the, the, the deciding factor is more microscopic, basically. But he mentions a study how IRL, this is probably not true. People who are more radical and have a higher party differential tend to be better informed. And that's probably because of advocation because those people just enjoy consuming political content. He mentions modeling some information is just entertainment and but he doesn't he doesn't say that this could fail because people with high party differentials like political entertainment more but that's probably the case so yeah that's it on that's it on the economic theory of democracy it's really it, the core of it, it like i said is really very simple Literally just applying rational utility theory to um, voters and parties. And then at the end, he gives these testable propositions. So they really all seem legit, just saying, like, con median voter theorem convergence, vague policies, ELO 4. This one seems unrealistic. Democrat governments redistribute income from the rich to the poor, maybe from the middle to the poor, but they don't do it from the rich. And then on rational citizens, it's like a bunch of stuff how they won't be. How uh, voters will vote, de like, they might avoid third parties if they don't want a different outcome. They won't acquire much information because it doesn't change much. They will care a lot about an issue if it affects their income. Huge. That's like Bronsky's Law of Teacher Politics, which states that... Uh, when teachers talk about education policy, they always want to raise. That's it. Like, if a teacher tells you about their vision for education, it always comes down to giving them a raise. When they go protest, it's always about getting a raise. It's literally that simple. I wonder if I could inductively prove that by just, like, listing... 20 examples of like teacher protests and anal analyzing how the how the policies that they want would increase like at least their hourly pay sometimes sometimes they want an easier job sometimes it's not like just give us money sometimes it's like we don't want to do common core because it's harder and it tells us what to do and we just want to tell little kids what to do or teenagers what to do. We don't want to be told what to do. That makes us work harder. We want to play movies in class and get paid. 
but that's like they're protesting against basically a reduction in their hourly wage because if they don't get a raise but they're told to work harder they have to work more hours and therefore their hourly just went down so but yeah rough, roughly speaking it's just all about their their income or their salary their pension dutton spoke about the bronski law of teacherism recently um did he mention me or was he just talking about how teachers are always, they only want to increase funding? Okay, yeah. So there was like, okay, so like ultimate review of this book, uh, not really enough math. Like the most interesting parts were the math. So like NVT literally just the median voter theorem which only com uh which only is relevant sometimes and then um the arrow problem of democracy was interesting the rest of it is almost like again it's unclear how you derive But yeah, this book should have had more math, but it's a pretty decent exposition. It probably also should have been like 30 pages. You can really skim it pretty hard. Um, not really anything mind-blowing in it, except anticipating, except like the critiques of democracy and maybe anticipating some political agency stuff. Not really enough empiricism. Again, it's like literally 300 pages of a model, but the model isn't even that mathematical. It's like kind of mathematical. It's like trying, unlike Moldberg, but there's really not many like equations in it or anything. And then just like no data. So yeah, uh, now I can read my, me a coffee, Joseph Bronski. I don't even, now I'll read this guy's chats. I don't know why he won't just do uh, power chats. He, he said, great job, man. Keep up the good work. He says, being able to create a software that generates responses to questions in the persona of an American liberal is impressive, but it's not going to be taking most jobs anytime soon, except for people whose sole responsibility is to basically be a chatbot. <laughs> That's such a BS job, so it'll only kill BS jobs. Why would it even kill BS jobs? The point of the BS job is to appear employed, not to actually do anything that makes money or is productive. So I don't even know that it'll do that. Chat GPT is unimpressive to me. It's just an aggregation of typical opinions expressed within the input data. It's more impressive to me what you have to do. What you have, what you have to do is, um, you have to use it for coding, basically. 
it's really impressive how it will spit out code and how it will be a better Google. Uh, but obviously, like, it wasn't even a liberal until um, they did that on purpose. It used to be base. It would, like, say racism, and then they cha like they changed it. They censored it. You should go. You should go look at that. There was a bunch of Twitter threads on that. How, like GPT three, like a year ago, was very based, and then they started censoring it because oh no. And so it's like been it's like been hard coded basically, to say liberal crap and to shut down and say I'm not supposed to talk about that. It literally says like, as an ethical AI model, I'm I find it you know, I can't disparage a group of people. Blah blah. blah. So yeah. On really esoteric stuff, it has no idea. Like if you ask it about the teen brain, it doesn't. It hasn't read my book because it's like the only other content on that is just saying that it develops at 25 or whatever. So it has it has no idea there. But for like H for like HBD, it knows. It just isn't allowed to say. You constantly talk of both doing exuciology full time and poverty. And also doing a postgraduate to earn money, which is it. I was doing undergraduate and I graduated like a week and a half ago. And now I'm doing it full time. But exuciology was my only job because undergrad isn't a job. And so now if I can't turn this into a full time job in three months, I have to go be a TA at grad school in a, P in a PhD program. Does everybody remember in history class being told mutually assured destruction was the cause of the modern peaceful age? This is the extent of analysis from innumerate people who derive their beliefs from academies and mainstream. Yeah, no comment on that. I don't really know. Reddit is not 100 IQ. Yeah, maybe it's like 105. I feel like it's gotten so low IQ, though. Most people, like, if you look at most Reddit comments now, they're very dumb. Many people suspect that there's just, like, full-time bots, like, literal chat bots now, too, that use Reddit. But just assuming, assuming that's not even true, let's just look at how, like, most of Reddit is not um, sustained reading. It's like... just reading headlines like no one is reading these articles and the comments are like oh my daycare is over twelve thousand dollars per year and it doesn't even cover the entire time i'm at work whoa dude like 100 IQ people might be dumb. We're broke, bitch, but, like, they're smart enough to write three words in Reddit, okay? Like, these are not. These sorts of comments might be, like, 105, 110, where they're, like, longer. And Reddit sort of used to be more like this, like, all the time. It wasn't just, like, single-line sentences. But Reddit has literally gone downhill. Like, I, I used it more when I was, like, 13, in like 2013 and it was cooler back then it was like ron paul it was just less cringe there were a bunch of racist subreddits like coontown and other there were other racist subreddits i don't even remember there's like fat people hate and then I remember it was like literally in June 2015, like the same week that uh, we got the gay marriage case, Obergefell v. Hodges. Reddit just mass banned all the cool subreddits like Fat People Hate and Coontown and stuff like that. And it just started censoring. And then si since then, it's just degenerated. It went from like, uh, you know, a strong core of maybe like 110 IQ libertarian leading types like maybe, you know, coastals, like software developer type people being close to your median, close to your median user to literally just random ass like wages that work at an Amazon package processing plant that like post one sentence comments all day. 
uh, while they're at work or whatever, like standing in the assembly line with their phone, uh, who are like liberals and stuff, right? Just like, and they really ramped up the censorship to attract those people, to attract like the lowest, dumbest, like brown people that won't tolerate a racism or a bi erasure or whatever. Um, and these people couldn't tell you who Ron, like Reddit was like Ron Paul 2012. And these people couldn't tell you who like that is and would think he's like a bigot. Now the media and Redditor would tell you Ron Paul is like a bigot fascist or whatever that like hates poor people. <laughs> and then like all the, all the comments are like little one lines, like one line, like vulgar sentences talking about what they do at work or whatever. And it's like, and it's like, literally look at this, like, and also just look at the comment when I'm at work we're broke bitch talking about money. I have people applying for a job that refuse because the pay is less than the cost of daycare. I don't set the pay. I just hire them. Three out of three comments are about like lacking money. They're like, and they're like institutional job that they didn't create. This is about, this is some woman talking about her kids probably. They had women. There used to not be women on Reddit, basically. Now it's like filled with women. They had to ban they had to ban the racism to get the women on, basically. They literally just wanted to expand. And what happens when your core user base is like free speech, libertarian, like mildly autistic dudes that might tend to be like software engineers and stuff like that? You have to censor the racism and water everything down. So you can attract more people because who are the more people who when you want to expand your base beyond that, who are you expanding to lower IQ, like brown people and women, stuff like that. Like you need 100 IQ people. You know how many low IQ people there are? The median Redditor was probably like 75th percentile IQ, maybe back in like 2012. Is the money expanding, is the money from ad revenue and a big user base from expanding your IQ upwards or downwards? Like the 75% of people that you're not capturing. It's called, you want to expand it downwards. You want to attract 90 IQ people who will tend to be brown and female, this sort of thing. So they banned the racism and it literally went downhill and now it's useless. Similar thing happened to 4chan. 4chan always made fun of Reddit, but like 4chan is totally useless now if you go on there. Every single top comment, this is like kind of a substantial comment. Redditors these days will literally respond to a comment like, can I get a too long didn't read? Like, whoa, that's a lot of words. You ever had that happen where you write like three sentences and people are like, that's a really big comment. Can you summarize that for me? I've had that happen. Not even kidding. <laughs> the comment is like 80 words. Nobody's going to read all that. <laughs> and it's like some guy who can't use their, uh, doesn't use their shift key. They like write in all lowercase without any punctuation. Can I lowercase get a, Get it too long, didn't read on this gigantic 80 word comment that's like three whole sentences. It's like <laughs> no punctuation. And that's not like a, that's not a show. You know, if you look at a person's account history like that, it's, they're always like that. Um, that's like definitely an IQ thing. That's like when you're 90 IQ. <laughs> Redditors be like, no fucking money, no fucking, just be vulgar for no reason. No fucking houses. Redditors, Redditors be like, I said the F word, am I cool? I literally hate that. <laughs> I hate Redditors so much. <laughs> okay, Fox News bot. This is what I'm talking about. This is the average, you think this guy's over 100 IQ? His comment is one line, no fucking money, no fucking money. That got Reddit gold. That got Reddit gold. And his most recent comment is, okay, Fox News bot. 
This is the kind of people they wanted to attract. You could move, and it's in response to somebody telling him to move out of Manhattan or downtown San Francisco. You could just you could just move to somewhere where you can rent a house for seven hundred bucks a month. Uh, that's Fox News. That's Fox News fake news. Twitter is a much better platform. It forces people to be concise, but yet they're still smart. Well, also, and you get to, like, Reddit. I always say this, like, 4chan is internet anarchy. Reddit is internet democracy. And Twitter is internet aristocracy. So on Twitter, you get to totally control your page and block people that you hate. Um, and then you get to control who you follow. So I only follow, like, famous people or, like, pseudo-famous people, like, interesting somewhat accomplished people basically like almost everyone who I follow is significant in at least some sort of mi minor way they're very intelligent have interesting intellectual output etc whereas on reddit it's like what are you given you're given some mass comment section where the first comment you see you don't get to curate it the first comment you see is what the masses voted on it's the most popular comment with the masses that's a democracy that's called when fucking san, uh, san francisco hobos with an iphone determine what a good comment is for you that's cringe that's democracy if steve saylor wrote a reddit comment it would get downvoted to death and then you'd get banned by the jannies and then i wouldn't be allowed to see it on reddit because reddit's a democracy but on Twitter, I can just follow Steve Saylor and block all the cringe people that are like, oh my gosh, how do I downvote Steve Saylor on Twitter? So Twitter's aristocracy. And then 4chan, it's like there's not really censorship or votes, but it's just like it's spam. So it's like anarchy. So you just see the first comment that some random dude posted basically first. Um, so it's not censored and it's not a democracy, but it's just like if there's some like schizo fat guy in a basement that wants to spam BBC or whatever, that's what happens on 4chan is you see BBC. And it's like, that's just anarchy. So that's gross. You can't filter that. So Twitter is the best of both worlds. I get to block the BBC trolls and then follow all the base 140 IQ racists. What extracurricular stuff did you drop AP statistics for? Can't imagine you. I was auditing the class, so I didn't drop it. I wasn't taking it for a grade, but I just decided not to do it anymore. It was actually because I was taking a night class that I couldn't drop um, for chem chemistry one at a community college. That it was just like too much. I got too stressed. Okay, I think that's all your new ones. Okay, well, I think that about wraps up this stream. Uh, thanks for the super chats. Uh, more more shekels for the study fund. Uh, hopefully by like Saturday I'll have some prolific studies out that I'll be able to talk about. So yeah, 